energy is the time integral of power. The unit of energy is joule, but often in electrical engineering, it is also expressed simply as watts times seconds. And even more common, especially if we look at the specification of energy delivery, for example, to a private household or to industry or the generation of energy in a power plant, we can find the unit kilowatt hours, also sometimes megawatt hours or gigawatt hours on bigger scales. And the kilowatt hours is simply a scaling of the watts by a factor of 1000 and the seconds into hours by a factor of 3600. To derive the energy in a resistor, we once more send a cosinusoidal current through that resistor. We have also done that when we looked at the power in a resistor and derived this equation. The power has twice the frequency of the original current and it has an offset here by a factor of one inside the brackets, which then get multiplied with the amplitude outside of the brackets. Integrating this equation over time gives the offset being a linear function of time and the cosinusoid turning into a sine wave and divide by the derivative of its argument. That means that the energy in a resistor accumulates linearly with time, that is the first term which is expressing that one, and it has a sinusoidal ripple on top of it, again with twice the original frequency of the current that we are sending through it, and this ripple is getting smaller and smaller with the frequency that the sinusoidal current has. The physical meaning of that equation is that the energy in a resistor can only rise, so that means all the electrical energy that is going into the resistor in terms of current and voltage, which gets converted into power, can only disappear, and that means it is getting physically converted into thermal energy, and from an electrical perspective, we call that losses because we cannot get this energy back in terms of current or voltage. We have previously looked into the power waveform of a resistor carrying that cosinusoidal current through it. Now the graphical expression of integrating that blue waveform into the energy turns into the linear equation rising with time as indicated by the straight line with the sinusoidal ripple on top of it. We can also interpret these two diagrams the other way around and say that the power is the derivative of energy. As we have the same time axis on the left and right side diagram, we can see that the derivative is highest at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of the period t. We got the period time t on the x-axis here and there. The highest derivative means that the energy is rising fastest whenever the instantaneous power has its highest value. The lowest value of the power occurs twice and is zero. That means at these points in time, the energy in the resistor is not rising, but the derivative is zero and kept steady at exactly this point. However, the energy in a resistor can never fall, so the resistor can never give any energy back to the circuit as the power is never going negative. Equally, for inductors, the energy in an inductor is the time integral of the instantaneous power of the inductor. And here I'm expressing the instantaneous power as the voltage across the inductor times the current through that inductor. Using Ohm's law, we can rewrite the voltage 
as the inductance times the derivative of the current. And we leave the time-dependent current as we had it in the left side of this equation. That means we end up with an integral over the inductor current times the time derivative of the exact same inductor current. For an integral of a variable x times the time derivative of that variable x, if we are integrating over time, we can find that this integral equals the square of x minus the exact integral that we were looking for in the first place. Now we can gather both of those integrals on one side of the equation. That means we have twice that integral that we are searching for on one side and x squared on the other side. Finally, solving that equation for the integral that we were looking for in the first place, we end up having x squared divided by 2 on the other side of the equation. Now in our case, x is the current through an inductor. That means the time derivative of x is the time derivative of the current through the inductor. And we can end up using the x squared. That means the current through the inductor squared divided by a factor of 2 to get the energy through an inductor. The inductance L was outside the integral and we keep it as a constant. That means the instantaneous energy in an inductor, so the energy at a specific time, is proportional to the current through that inductor squared and the proportional factor is the inductance divided by 2. Once more, we can send a sinusoidal test current through our inductor. For the energy in the inductor, that means we have the factor L divided by 2 in front here, and the current is getting squared. That means the amplitude is getting squared, and the cosine is getting squared. And as we have looked at a cosine squared previously, we can see that the equation for a cosine squared is 1 plus the cosine of twice the frequency, and we divide by another factor of 2. So now we already have a division by a factor of 4 in front here. The highest value we can get from the equation in the brackets, so the 1 plus the cosine, is 2, and the lowest value is 0. This means the energy in the inductor is cycling sinusoidally. A cosine wave is a sinusoidal waveform as well, between 0 and the peak, which is defined by the amplitude of the energy out here. Electrically speaking, that means that whenever the energy is rising, the inductor is getting magnetized. At the peak, all the energy of the inductor is stored in the magnetic field of that inductor. And when it's falling again, we retrieve that energy, we take it out of the inductor, the inductor is getting demagnetized, we collect all the energy that has been stored in the magnetic field, and we regain it as an electrical current through the inductor. So compared to a resistor that only can burn energy, can only convert energy into thermal energy, which would be electrically lost, we can put money in the bank in an inductor, we can store energy, and we can retrieve it again as much as we like. The graphical representation for the power, the instantaneous power in that inductor, is a negative sine wave. It starts out being negative, that means the area underneath the waveform is negative, so we are actually starting retrieving energy 
from the inductor, the energy in the inductor is falling and reaching its zero point when the power in the inductor starts to turn around and the inductor is getting magnetized again. That is at the zero crossing here and the energy in the inductor starts rising over there until it finally reaches its next turnaround point at half of the period time t. That is where the inductor is fully magnetized again. It reaches the peak of the energy and from there on it starts to cycle. It is demagnetizing again. That is the power through the inductor is negative. That's the area in here and afterwards it magnetizes again. So in this case, the energy is actually a periodic waveform and we have a maximum and a minimum for it. The maximum energy stored in the inductor and fully demagnetized when it's zero. The equations for a capacitor are very equivalent. The energy stored in a capacitor is the time integral of the instantaneous power of the capacitor, that is the voltage across the capacitor, multiplied by the current running through it, which gives a similar integral as we had with the inductor, with the capacitance in front of the integral. And now we are expressing through Ohm's law, the current as a function of the voltage. That means the current is the derivative of the voltage. And we keep the voltage in here from the left side of the equation here. Once more, we can solve that integral through partial integration or look it up in a math textbook. And the solution of the time integral of x multiplied by the derivative of x is x squared divided by a factor of 2. In this case, x is the voltage across the capacitor and we end up as the final solution for the energy in the capacitor at a given time t to be the voltage squared at that exact same time t multiplied by half of the capacitance of our capacitor. To represent the power and the energy in a capacitor graphically, I'm using a cosinusoidal voltage across it. That means the energy is the capacitance divided by a factor of 2 times that cosinusoidal voltage squared, where the cosine squared gives a 1 plus the cosine of twice the frequency, and we keep the amplitude squared in front of the brackets. Equivalently to the inductor, also, this waveform is cycling between zero and a factor of two in the brackets. That means the amplitude in front of the bracket is getting scaled between zero and twice the multiplication of these constants here. Finally, that also leads that the energy in the capacitor is sinusoidally cycling between zero and its peak. When the energy level is rising, the capacitor is getting charged. And when it's at its peak, all the energy in a capacitor is stored in the electrical field, which we can later retrieve again, and we can discharge the capacitor. In that terminology, a capacitor stores the electrical energy in an electrical field E between its plates. You use the same terminology and also the same equations for describing the behavior of a battery. Batteries are often not rated in terms of capacitance because you assume a constant voltage across them. If the voltage is always the same, you can specify the energy in ampere hours, which physically is the charge of the capacitor. The power and energy waveforms for a capacitor look exactly the same as the power and energy waveforms looked like for an inductor. 
the terminology is different. Instead of demagnetizing, we call it discharging. And instead of magnetizing, we call it charging. So that means when the energy is falling in the capacitor, it is discharging. And when the energy is rising, it is charging. Finally, it's up to you to determine the waveforms for power and energy in a given capacitor. The capacitor is specified to be 10 nanofarads, often also expressed in microfarads. How does the current, the power, and the energy as a function of time look like as a waveform? And is the capacitor absorbing power, delivering power, or is it doing both of those? And similarly for an inductor with the given current flowing through it, the inductor being 100 millihenry big, how does the power waveform and the energy waveform look like? Is the inductor absorbing power? Is it delivering power? Or is it doing both?